REM subpopulations, which account for about 70% of all inhibitory neurons. And like I said, in terms of how they differ, you know, it, you know, they differ in terms of their biophysical properties, in terms of their synaptic properties, and how they're embedded into uh, these circuits. And that's what I'll be um, kind of mentioning here just at first, just in terms of the connectivity. Again, at the population level, we have a good idea of how uh, these populations, um, in terms of the effective connectivity. And we can really see kind of a key difference kind of just right off the bat here of, you know, these PV um, subtype has these recurrent um, inhibition, right? So they inhibit themselves while some cells, you know, don't have this recurrence. And we'll see that's kind of going to be a, a key kind of component, as well as just the fact that, you know, PV can inhibit um, E, but PV does not have a direct um, line to SOM, while SOM does have a direct line to PV. And, you know, we spent a lot of time just kind of um, across the years focusing on EI networks. And there's been a lot of theory focused on this type of, this type of diagram. And we're just really only starting to kind of scrape the beginnings of investigating these more complete circuits and the kind of computations that, you know, by having these additional inhibitory subtypes, what they kind of enable these circuits to do. So I just want to mention some of the work that's come out of the lab that I'm a part of, the of Duran lab. Um, <clears throat> and so there's this, this nice work here that came out in 2016 that extended kind of inhibition stabilized networks to include these different subclasses. And they also looked at how, you know, these different subclasses um, influence gain control. And this more recent paper that is currently on the archive that kind of further investigates this network. And I want to take a, just a quick moment to kind of go through some of the results here in terms of let's step through the circuit and see how the different pathways can enable kind of different um, network activity. So the first pathway I want to talk about is this kind of disinhibition pathway. So you can imagine there's some modulatory current coming into SOM um, that's going to depolarize them. So that it's going to increase in spiking that therefore they're going to inhibit PV cells and that will drive um, excitatory cells to fire more. So we can take a look at what this does. And basically, this is exactly what I just said. Uh, we see that SOM cells increase in firing rate. That is followed by excitatory firing rate increasing. Um, you know, there's a slight dip in PV. Of course, E and PV cells are kind of coupled. And we see that, you know, over time, PV cells do increase, but not before excitatory cells kind of are let loose. Um, one thing that we can study with this network is known as gain, basically the sensitivity of the excitatory neurons to changes in their stimulus. And we see that by increasing this modulatory effect, we can kind of see this increase in gain. Um, if we kind of step around here, we see that, you know, at this lower point, we have this nice asynchronous solution we increase the modulatory effect. We still are kind of in this asynchronous solution. We're seeing a, a, a big kind of divergence uh, starting to occur between the theory, the solid line, and um, the simulations. But we see um, at, you know, when we increase this even more, basically, you know, the excitatory cells, this disinhibition pathway takes full effect. PV cells are unable to inhibit, and, you know, uh, the network loses stability, right? And we end up with a synchronous solution kind of arising. Now let's contrast this with a different pathway, which we'll call kind of the direct pathway. SOM cells are now going to directly inhibit excitatory cells. And here now the modulatory um, current is going to hyperpolarize SOM cells, and that's going to lead to a loss of direct inhibition to excitatory cells. So at the end of the day, it starts out, you know, in a similar story. SOM cells now, though, are going to decrease the firing rate but that's still going to lead to an increase in excitatory firing rate, similar to the first case. But now, because some cells aren't inhibiting PV directly, they're able to really track excitatory cells very closely. We see that we see, have a similar kind of role in gain. Basically, this molitory effect is able to increase um, the gain of the excitatory population. But as we kind of step through this, we see that stability is not lost. Right. So as we kind of step through, in all these cases, we have this nice asynchronous um, solution that exists and stability is not lost. So that kind of talks about this division of labor that was in the title. 
SOM cells are able to essentially modulate gain of excitatory neurons as long as they let PV cells kind of worry about the stability of the network. So PV cells are left to the stability of the network. SOM cells can then kind of modulate through this direct pathway, um, you know, this, this gain control. Of course, that's kind of just a proof of concept, right? We, you know, kind of turn it off, turn on and off these different um, connections. Um, but it's just kind of this proof of concept that yes, we can have this division of labor. Now I wanna push this framework further and really look at a complex um, computation that the cortex does specifically in the auditory cortex. Um, and we're gonna be looking at direction selectivity there. And we can kind of, uh, we wanna see, you know, by including these additional um, subclasses, how does that kind of enable um, this type of computation to occur? Um, so I wanna start uh, with going through kind of the experimental data here collected by my uh, collaborator Hiroyuki Kato at University of North Carolina. And so we have the A1, we have the auditory cortex and we can apply pure tones. And we see that different neurons, depending on their spatial location, prefer different, um, uh, different frequencies. Um, A1 is, has this nice kind of feature in the fact that we are on this tonotopic axis. Basically, as you move from left to right, um, the neuron's preference increases from low frequencies to high frequencies. This is not, you know, this is nothing new here. This, this has been known. But, you know, the fact is we're not looking at pure tones, or at least the mice aren't looking at pure tones, right? Day to day, they are dealing with frequency sweeps. And that's what's seen here in terms of what they actually see. So what are these different free, um, sweeps? So sometimes we have a, a low to high frequency sweep. And sometimes we have a high to low frequency sweep. Um, and we kind of see this kind of all over the spectrum. There's a lot of different um, types of sounds that these mice are making. Uh, we can actually classify these different so sounds into different um, types in terms of a, just a nice isolation call, maybe a longer court sip song. And then we can ask, what direction are these sweeps in? Or is it, you know, in the upward direction or is it a downward sweep? And how fast are those sweeps um, occurring? And we see that kind of across these very different types of sounds, we see a similar distribution arising in which for one, there's a lot of uh, frequency sweeps in both directions and the speed of those sweeps are, are varied with a lot occurring kind of a, kind of a relatively slow frequency sweep speed. Similar to these pure tones, um, you know, in terms of some neurons preferring just a pure a specific frequency, we can then ask, are those neurons, do they respond specifically to a direction of these sweeps? And we see here with cell one, this cell prefers upward um, frequency sweeps in which it doesn't respond at all to any downward sweeps and has very strong upward response. Cell two, on the other hand, prefers a downward um, sweep. Cell three is kind of in the middle of the response kind of well to both. Maybe there's a slight preference of the upward sweep, but at the end of the day, we have you know, these different um, cells that can prefer uh, different directions. And we classify this with direction selectivity index uh, where it's basically this integral across time of the upward sweep um, compared to the downward sweep. And what we see here is that this direction selectivity, this neuron pr preference, um, doesn't, you know, it, it's seen across sweep speeds, right? So if you just slow it up, that doesn't mean that direction selectivity goes away. And if you have a very fast sweep, again, direction selectivity is intact. Now going back to the tonotopic axis where we had the low frequency and high frequency neurons, we can then plot DSI and we see an interesting mapping between the two. Namely, if you're a low frequency preferring neuron in terms of these pure tones, you're going to most likely prefer a upward sweep. And as you move across the tonotopy and you then become you know, a neuron in terms of pure tone, you prefer a high frequency um, tone, you end up preferring a downward uh, frequency sweep, All right? So that's kind of this interesting mapping between the two. And that's really what we wanna get at, exactly where does this mapping kind of arise? And the main hypothesis driving this work is that this occurrence actually arises in, this, in the cortex, right? Via the recurrent dynamics. And it's not inherited by feed forward 
input. So the question is, how exactly does this observation arise in this circuit? So now let's take a closer look at a perf upward preferring neuron and actually measure the currents going in doing kind of a voltage patch clamp um, <clears throat> experiment. So here we're holding it um, at negative 70 and we're looking at EPSC, um, so excitatory currents, and they're going to be represented by uh, downward uh, trajectories here. So we can see here, so this is an upward preferring neuron. And we see that in, when we look at speeds going in the upward direction, we do have these kind of strong excitatory blips that occur. And, none, and that does not occur in the downward direction. One thing that's seen in both directions is a very strong inhibitory um, current that we're referring to as network suppression. And we see that occurs after the excitatory um, blip occurs in the upward direction. Um, and then here, we, again, we don't see excitatory blip, so we just have this network suppression taking over. So we see here, again, just kind of zooming in, we have this excitatory current that's followed by this network suppression. And in the null case, in the non-preferred uh, direction, we see that basically this neuron does not receive any of these excitatory currents. Now we hold the cells at uh, positive 20. So now we're looking at inhibitory um, currents. And we see that we have a nice kind of sharp uptick, again, in the preferred direction. And in the null direction, again, we see that very kind of strong kind of um, basically network suppression kind of limits these. So you can kind of see here that we have this nice upward blip representing this kind of fast inhibitory current. But this network is, this, this response is suppressed um, in the null direction. So in terms of kind of comparing the upward, in this case, that's the preferred direction of this neuron with the downward, the null direction, we see this asymmetric charge where both the excitatory current and the inhibitory current uh, responds stronger in the preferred direction. So this is kind of our first indication here that an EI network, in terms of a modeling perspective, right? I, I, I like to kind of approach these things from kind of a more meal, uh, minimalistic viewpoint. Let's just put in the components necessary to kind of explain um, the experimental observation. This data clearly shows that a simple EI network is simply not going to get the job done because both the excitatory component and the inhibitory component is suppressed in the null direction. So we need to clearly extend our investigation to look at these additional subtypes. And that's exactly what we did. So experimentally, we go in and we can optogenetically silence PV cells. And then we can ask, what effect does that have on direction selectivity? And we see here, so we have, again, in this column here, we have the preferred direction. So we have the default case in black, and then the optogenetic silencing in orange, and we see very little difference. In the null case, we see that basically if we compare, you know, kind of the area under these two curves, right, so this is an upward preferring neuron, you know, we have a decrease um, here, and that occurs for both the black and the orange case, so in the default case, as well as the um, optogenetic silence case meaning that silencing PV cells did not really influence um, the direction selectivity of this neuron. And we can kind of see this across population that that's a consistent result. One thing that I want to note here is that we did have to be careful when silencing PV cells, because if you silence them too much, you lose stability in this network and um, it, it's just everything kind of goes out of whack. So we had to kind of tune this enough so that stability was still intact, um, and then we, but at the end of the day, we just see that direction selectivity is not affected by science in PV cells. Some cells, on the other hand, we see a different story. Again, we see uh, black is a default case, and orange is uh, uh, the SOM being silenced, SOM population. And we see in the preferred direction, there's no difference. But in the null direction, we see that this neuron before in the default case did not respond. Now, there's a very strong response. So the direction selectivity of this neuron that we're investigating here loses the ability, in some sense, to kind of have that selectivity. It's, it got a weaker um, effect. 
And again, that's kind of consistent across the population. And we see a lot of these dots are below this one-to-one -one line once um, these cells were um, inhibited. So then just to, I want to kind of connect all these different pieces together because these are the pieces that we want to approach now with our, our model. And that is cells are um, selective for frequency sweeps. And depending on what direction they prefer on depends on where they are on the tonotopic axis. Low frequency preferred neurons respond, have a positive DSI, meaning upward sweep. High uh, frequency uh, preferring neurons have a negative DSI preferred downward sweeps. There's this interesting asymmetry in charge, right? There's this more charge, both excitatory and inhibitory, um, in the preferred direction compared to the null direction. And we see that SOM cells are very kind of a crucial component, um, while PV cells don't really seem to have a major impact on direction selectivity. So we observe that, but you know, the question is, and the question remains here, you know, why are SOM cells able to have this kind of very strong role in this computation? What allows them um, to play that in this circuit? Meanwhile, you know, what kind of prevents PV cells um, to basically have a minimal effect? And that's something that we can get at um, if we build up a model. So what exactly will our model look like? Well, we're gonna have a model of the tonotopic axis here. So we have low frequency to high frequency. Uh, we're gonna have a phenomenological model in terms of we have an equation that kind of represents the activity of these different populations at each point of this axis. So it's gonna be you know, this nice spatial model. We're also gonna have another kind of differential equation that is gonna have, you know, basically converts activity to firing rate. And one of the key components of why we um, kind of wanted to include this model was the observation that some neur neurons have this kind of delay in recruitment. They seem like there's a delay in terms of um, receiving um, um, and get, just kind of getting recruited into the circuit and responding. Um, there's gonna be six total um, equations, uh, right? So one um, equation for each population. And then I'll just note that this B term here is outside this integral and it, it's represented by the stimulus that is kind of into, that's going into the circuit that's represented by this, this tone and this frequency sweep. So at each point in the axis, we have this local connectivity, which is what we saw earlier. Uh, the feed forward input is only going to excitatory and PV cells, which is consistent um, uh, with the known kind of connectivity of, these, of, the, of the circuit. We also, I want to talk about in terms of the spatial connectivity. How does this connectivity look spatially? Um, so we have, um, you know, we have E projecting onto PV and PV projecting onto E, which is known to kind of be of, of a similar width. What is also known is that in terms of SOM cells, that width in terms of incoming excitatory input and outgoing um, inhibitory input is, is on a broader scale. Um, and that's also true for SOM on to PV. So we have this kind of broader spatial scale when it comes to the inputs coming into SOM cells as well as the outputs going on to um, excitatory and PV cells from the SOM population. And that's represented you know, here in terms of this Gaussian kind of distribution in terms of that similar previous equation of this connectivity. Um, so yeah, so we can, we can kind of see that here. Um, we have, um, you know, a threshold nonlinearity that pops up basically to prevent, you know, the firing rate, um, this activity to, from dipping below uh, zero. Um, so I, I, I did want to highlight that. And with these components in the model, we can then define a similar kind of DSI calculation and see that DSI arises in this circuit in a similar way that was seen experimentally. So again, we have the model result here and we have the experimental data on the left-hand side. And we see kind of a similar thing. Again, um, low um, preferring um, frequency neurons have a positive DSI and we have this nice kind of transition uh, to negative DSI as you move across the tonotopy. So Greg, th 10 minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, so I wanna kind of just focus on, you know, we can see a video of this and I'll show this video uh, twice um, with, uh, basically, we see the input and we can kind of see this kind of this wave, this traveling wave moving across the tonotopy. Um, and we're, we're tracking here and here both um, a low frequency preferred neuron 
and a high frequency where so we have a positive DSI and a negative DSI. Uh, so I just wanted to show that have that video on run once and now we can go back and actually take a closer look at what's actually happening and we see initially we're at a nice steady state and we have inputs um, into it and when so that's the dash line so as soon as you know the stimulus arrives you know there's no inhibition the cells are able to respond to their fullest and that's what we see here in terms of this red dot we're able to really have a very strong response because it's no inhibition that it has to overcome. PV cells increase, um, but that's just mainly to prevent, um, you know, stability from going out of whack. Now, over time though, so if we go here, we see that, you know, the system has a leading inhibition that arises, that silences the cells. So then later neurons have to then overcome that inhibition first, as seen here, before they can respond. And as a response, their overall response is limited. Um, so this is just kind of a breakdown of these different currents. And again, we have this leading suppression that has to be um, overcome in the null case. And we see that like the, um, the data, we have this asymmetry in charge that occurs in the model. Similar to um, the experimental um, work, we can silence SOM cells in the model and see does this prevent um, selectivity or it doesn't prevent DSI and we see that to be exactly the case when we block SOM in our model we lose DSI. Why does that arise? It's because we lose this network suppression, this leading ne network suppression. These cells are no longer silenced and we see that we lose this asymmetry in charge. Similar we can block PV cells and no effect is done in PV uh, in terms of DSI. Um, and we see that, you know, this leading suppression is very much intact when you block PV. Now we can kind of get at something that the, you know, the data, you can't really play around with, and that's kind of the spatial scale of SOM cells, right? So we want to get at, you know, what's the key components of the model? And as you change the spatial scale of SOM cells, we see that that also, right, so we make them more narrow, that causes a loss in DSI, right? So basically, we lose that leading um, inhibition because it's not able to project ahead of this traveling wave that we saw. So that is a very kind of key component that was brought to our attention by this model. Another key um, kind of fact that I'll just kind of mention here is this threshold nonlinearity. You can kind of imagine maybe, you know, we had a higher operating point in which we would go from a, um, a nonlinear model to essentially a model that we can linearize. And we see when we do that, we have a DSI of zero. So this nonlinearity that arises is key. Um, and one of the nice things about doing it, and I'll just kind of have the slide here, you know, this is a relatively kind of simple model. We just have these different populations, but now we can mathematically go in and prove uh, why that is the case. Why um, having a linear model, and it ends up being a kind of a pretty straightforward proof in terms of just using the fundamental theorem of calculus to show that you will always um, have a DSI of zero. So again, that's kind of a key component of the model. Um, this is not, I don't think, super surprising in the sense that uh, basically this says that we have neurons, right? We know that the neurons, the, the intrinsic property of neurons have this nonlinearity. However, you could imagine that, you know, that nonlinearity might not come through. It might be weak. So this basically shows and suggests that in terms of the parameters regime that we're in, that we have kind of strong recurrent interactions, which is typical of um, ISN um, parameter regimes. So that kind of helps um, tell us kind of where we are, what the operating point of the system is in. All right, so then just to wrap up, again, kind of what does this model show? Well, it shows that SOM inhibition, you know, the key component is really the fact that it's this broad, this broadness in terms of the connectivity. Um, and I, I want to kind of connect this kind of to an earlier point. This is really only made possible because PV cells are there and they're controlling stability. If we think about this asymmetry and charge that arises, um, if that was left to PV cells, you could imagine this could be dangerous. If we just had an EI network, this could be dangerous because you're saying that basically excitatory cells are you know, very active in one state and low in the other state. Um, and that could lead to the network becoming unstable. 
But this network that we're looking at here doesn't have that problem because SOM cells are able um, to modulate the network while PV cells are able to worry about stability. And then lastly, again, we have this non um, linear uh, circuit, which again just kind of points out that we have these kind of strong recurrent connections in this, in this um, circuit. Um, and then, you know, we just submitted this work um, and we just responded to the first waves of revisions. So hopefully it will be coming out soon. So with that, I would like to uh, definitely thank everyone in the Duran lab, especially uh, Brent, as well as my experimental collaborators. Excellent, thank you. So uh, there's a question here from uh, Antonio Oliveira Fonseca. Uh, Gregory, great work. A substantial part of the mice's vocal repertoire is composed of step-like USVs. Have you looked for neurons that prefer USVs with frequency discontinuities or more complex USVs? Or are those USVs just represented as a combination of neurons tuned for up and down or sweeps? Maybe you can say what USVs are. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so yeah, I'm not um, entirely sure. So, 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 I, I, mean, I guess I could answer it in part in this. We haven't looked into that. Um, but that, that's a good thing. That's something that I could kind of pass on um, to my experimental collaborators and see if, if they've considered that. Uh, good. Uh, and then this one from John Meng. Great work. Have you considered adding VIP cells in the model? Yeah, no, definitely. VIP cell, it, it's just interesting. So basically in the work that was kind of done leading into this, uh, VIP cells didn't really show kind of a change in kind of um, their activity. So it was just kind of, kind of taken at this first part. It's like, okay, let's not focus on that. Hmm. Um, that said, I am doing other work in, um, in, in auditory cortex in terms of we're, we're damaging um, these neurons and we're looking at how they kind of recover over time. And in that framework, VIP cells are actually a very necessary component of this, of this model, of the circuit. Um, so yes, 100% uh, we have also kind of considered that. And I think USVs, it's been like, it's, it's ultrasonic vocalizations. That's what, uh, oh, okay. yeah. anyway. So Greg, what effect could different axonal delays among populations of inhibitory neurons have on the observed activity? And would it be possible to assume different delays? Sure, yeah, no, definitely. And I think delays, you know, one thing that we looked at, we kind of implemented with that kind of additional temporal filter. Um, and I think delays could help shape DSI kind of across the tonotopy, um, depending on how you tune that. Um, if you had no delay and if there was basically, we got rid of that temporal filter, we would notice a very sharp transition. Um, by including that filter, we were able to kind of make it a more gradual transition. So I think really just having these delays could really help kind of sharply tune, you know, different neurons and exactly how their, um, their DSI preference. We also have obviously direct direction selectivity applying to visual stimuli in V1. Do you expect, do you expect like a similar mechanism there? I, I would, yeah, I, I think it's a little bit more complicated in the sense that, you know, the tonotopy, the A1 tonotopy is nice. It's like this linear kind of thing. Everything kind of lies on this nice axis. In the visual cortex, you know, it is, you know, everything is just kind of jumbled up on this two-dimensional plane more so. So I think, but I think some cells, this broad um, connectivity surround suppression, I think all that could come into play. Mm. And I think, you know, this division of labor, I think, you know, that direction of selectivity in V1, that, that kind of division labor is arising in, in places like V1. Mm. 